In the air, Shishan takes it! India win! He'll come back for the second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India at home. Lords goes wild. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out podcast. We uh, continue to call ourselves 81 All Out despite uh, all that has happened over the last uh, couple of weeks. We are here again, the same team of 81 All Out to talk about uh, India's win in uh, Melbourne to level the series 1-1. It was an eight-wicket win. And uh, I'm your host, uh, Siddhartha Vaidyanathan at Sidvi on Twitter. And uh, joining me today, we have... Uh, Ashoka, who is at AB Van on Twitter, who has now become um, uh, a rage with uh, all that, uh, his reactions that he came up with after the last test. So hi, Ashoka. I hope you're living fine with your celebrity status. I'm, uh, what, what, what's happening here? <laughs> hey, Sidvi. <laughs> hi. We also have uh, Kartikeya, who is at Cricketing View on Twitter. Uh, hi, Kartikeya. Hello, hello. Hi, and we have uh, Mahesh, who is at Cornered on Twitter. Hello. Yeah, so let me just set it up by talking about the win and placing it in some kind of context. Ravi Shastri, the Indian coach, is often given to exaggeration. But this time, I think he has got it right when he says that this is one of the great comebacks in all cricket, not just Indian cricket. And uh, given the context, uh, one can't disagree with him. I mean, first of all, the players have been living in this bubble for such a long time. It's not easy to play cricket when you have, you know, little else to do. There's absolutely nothing in terms of diversions and and you go from the hotel room to the ground and back. And um, many players have spoken about the difficulty of that. Uh, apart from that, of course, you have the series context where India were 36 all out in Adelaide. And then Virat Kohli, their best batsman and their captain had to re- uh, return home, chose to return home. And uh, you also had uh, Mohamed Shami, who was forced to return home because of the injury. Um, Apa, uh, India were playing without Ishan Sharma anyway through the series. And then midway through this game, Umesh Yadav gets injured. So, I mean, this is, uh, you're pretty much playing with, uh, you know, your uh, two best bowlers in uh, Bumrah and Ashwin. And then uh, everyone else who has to support them. So, given that, and uh, given also that... Uh, you know, Australia are a formidable side at home. I mean, uh, people may look at them and say that their batting is weak. But uh, to beat uh, any any Australian side, especially this one, with such a good bowling attack and uh, with uh, two terrific batsmen in Smith and Labushin, who haven't really got going in this series, but who are capable of, uh, you know, uh, getting huge scores and big hundreds. And uh, I won't be surprised if they do come back in the next two tests. So given all that, uh, this is uh, r- this ranks really high. Uh, historically, uh, people still talk a lot about um, Melbourne in 1981, uh, which will probably be uh, the one of the freakiest and uh, <laughs> most surprising wins in Indian cricket. Uh, simply because uh, you know the there are a lot of parallels there. I mean, Kapil Dev was fully injured there; he had a hamstring strain. Uh, Dilip Doshi was injured. Shivlal Yadav was injured, and yet. Uh, a strong Australian side were bowled out for 83, chasing uh, 140 something, and uh, you know that side had Greg Chappell and uh, batsmen like uh, Doug Walters, uh, but uh, they fell for 83. And I think those who heard that on radio or those who uh, you know read about that uh, <laughs> couldn't believe that this has happened. So uh, and then, of course, I was fortunate enough to be at Perth. Uh, for the test in 2008, which India went on to win, which uh, I would think is perhaps a slightly a bigger achievement than this, only because of the context of that series. I mean, there was so much bad blood after Sydney. The team was under siege. They were hauled up in the Sydney hotel. Uh, there was no guarantee whether they would even play the next test for a while. So to go to the WACA and then to beat that Australian side... Uh, was a remarkable achievement. This is uh, very, very close to that in my estimation and um, will be remembered for a really, really long time. And before we start, I mean, if there is uh, one person that we must mention and highlight, I mean, and who will be associated with this test for a long time, it's their stand-in captain, Ajinkya Rahane, 
has come in for a lot of praise, justifiably so. And uh, to hold that batting together, I mean, he was the glue that held the innings together. Uh, he, uh, you know, uh, it, once you're all out for 36, there is bound to be uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uncertainty and nervousness among most teams. But I think uh, this team is good enough to realize that, um, you know, that was an off day and you move on and you continue to, uh, you know, follow the uh, methods and processes that have brought you success. I mean, that's exactly what Rahane did. Um, he, I was thinking that by now, Ajinkya Rahane would have, um, uh, you know, if not on par, at least he would be one level below the likes of Kohli and um, Williamson. And um, But uh, Rahane has had a up and down career. He's been uh, even dropped. And, uh, you know, he's a rarity among uh, Indian batsmen who tends to do better abroad than at uh, in home conditions. He's somebody who is uh, uh, clinical in his play. Um, he, you know, there is a gradation to his strokes and how much force he provides them. There is, uh, he's not always trying to hit the ball hard. There are some delicate dabs and even during some drives, he doesn't necessarily go full on. He uh, pats the ball and uh, there is a lot of effectiveness to that. I mean, so, um, apart from the captaincy and uh, the way he has carried himself throughout and even during the victory, I mean, it, it wasn't as if uh, he he behaved like uh, this was an unbelievable win or anything. It was just, um, you know, his demeanor overall uh, made it appear like uh, India were here to win and this was the job they had come to do and this is what they did. So, anyway, that is my opening uh, spiel and uh, had, I thought I had to start off by setting it up and uh, now anyway ashoka you can take it away what do you make of it you know when 36 all out happened i thought it was on par with the bubonic plague that happened and wiped half of the planet it was that bad now when we have won melbourne i think uh, you know i think this is probably since the invention of cricket i think this is one of the greatest things to have happened to cricket and it might seem like an exaggeration, but it is a scientifically proven fact because of some reasons, right? As you said, first of all, we didn't have Kohli, uh, we didn't have Ishant, we didn't have Shami, we didn't have Sachin, we didn't have Kapil, we didn't have Sardar Vallabhai Patel. <laughs> we didn't have anybody. Actually, we had like, you know, three, four haystick figures standing in the ground. I mean, and Australians were setting fire to it and still we won this test match. And that is such a, something incredible. You know, the 11 people who played the match are asking, why, why are you not talking about us? Why are you talking about Kohli not being there, Isha not being there? But I think this is a fairly accurate statement. Uh, uh, you know, to win a match without anybody who can play cricket, I think that is a great achievement. That is one. Secondly, I think, uh, you know, as last week, we had like 36 all out. That was such a psychological blow. It was not even such a psychological blow, you know. Uh, as per the laws of Indian government, I think uh, BCCI cut the hands and feet of players as punishment. But even without hand and feet, I think uh, just by holding the bat with his teeth, Ajinkya Rahane made a great 100. I think that is some of the glorious things on cricket. So that is the second reason. Third reason, I think uh, Rahane's leadership. If you see, uh, our ancient texts also say this, like when Rama was not ruling, ruling Ayodhya, uh, Bharata ruled it on his behalf by having just the slippers, Rama slippers. If you closely watch Rahane's innings, no, you can see Kohli's shoes jutting out of his helmet. Oh, so, I such see. was a dedication. Such was a dedication to you know his captaincy uh, and to the respect to Kohli. I, these are the very cricket-centric reasons why I think we won this Test match, and I think also we won half of US and the rest of the world. We now are the owners of the entire free world and I think uh, we should just start, you know, taxing everybody and uh, enriching our pockets. So, okay. these, this is what I first, these are my first impressions. I think I'll come with, uh, you know, far more scientific uh, reasons as uh, Kartikeya starts exaggerating why we won because of, you know, we batted well, we bowled in the right channels, the percentage, <laughs> the control. All these rubbish exaggerations Kartikeya will bring forth, and I know that he definitely will. But, uh... Yeah, and one important point in your level-headed analysis is that uh, this could also be such a 
boost for india that uh, this could basically substitute the corona vaccine so this win could be the vaccine that we have been waiting for i, I think already 7 to 8 million people have been cured and uh, they are already thanking you know the bcci and rahane is getting letters by the millions this is this is something that we should be very proud of this is a great achievement for india I think. okay okay so as kartikeya has uh, said uh, ashoka is somebody who gives voice to the voiceless so uh, on that note um, i i don't know how i'm controlling my laughter but now i i think these things are also uh, very believable these days to hear people say these things so well done well done ashoka uh, mahesh uh, uh, coming to you you spoke about uh, how uh, you felt uh, 36 was uh, something that uh, you genuinely felt uh, people uh had to feel grief about because of course cricket matters starts mattering only when you genuinely care about it you think uh the same of this which is a reverse emotion of course but uh i guess this will hold more than that right i think people will be more joyous about this than they were depressed about that i think so and i also think because of what has happened today it gives a greater context to the 36 all out because india have went on to you know win against the odds so to say now you know the 36 all out adds to it right oh without kohli without ishan sharma without sachin even said without rohit sharma i found that funny um, you know without uh, umesh without shami and you know coming back from 36 all out so i think the 36 all out gets greater context from this win uh, you know like when like the perth win that you mentioned going into the perth as the pressure of all that had gone post the sydney test for instance during the course and post the sydney test was building up there's no question that the team was feeling it so the perth win really came as as a release of all that accumulated pressure and and sort of the uh, you know being wrongly uh, accused of racism you know uh, having gone through poor umpiring basically being wronged at several levels but this essentially you know even in the adelaide test looking back at it even people who are involved like uh, you know to their credit even the players did not overreact to it they tried to explain it away as one bad session and we discussed this siddharth monga wrote about it so the general discourse itself was fairly sensible which is quite uh, uh, quite refreshing for me because it's very easy for cricketers like you mentioned about shrinath asking cricketers to apologize in the last episode it's very easy for cricketers to say i mean kohli did make a statement about intent and all that but i guess that was just to please people who want to write something but by and large the team knew what it had done well and where it slipped and they backed themselves to reproduce that level of control that level of skills again and and while you could argue that india missed a lot of their frontline players but their bowling attack uh, was still very very good i mean between bumra and ashwin you have two one you know promising potentially great bowler and another established great bowler with extraordinary control with extraordinary skill and they were helped by the fact that they had bowling that they played jadeja who's also uh, you know high quality spinner or, uh, who was not used to much and uh, the fact that the the new uh, the, the the pacer on debut had a very very impressive debut but by and large i think the team did not make too much of the 86, the, the 36 all out so so i think this win gives itself gives the 36 all out much more context than than uh, had it been followed up with another loss or something yeah or even a draw i mean i think uh, you know the the two serve as good uh, uh, opposites and uh, you know will be remembered al- almost together i mean every time someone mentions melbourne so the mind will go back to the 36 all out and what happened after so kartikeya um are we making too much of this win and what were your thoughts were you were you moved no it's a very good team they won because they played better they they bowled better or rather you know they they bowled as well as the australians and their batsmen so i had longer than the australians and so they won but i i should i i i, I think i think ab van our friend uh gives voice to the voiceless has absolutely hit the nail on the head you know you know with the start of this test match ajinkya rahane was emblematic of the fact that this generation of indian batting is it's all rubbish it's all faltu none of them are any good like you know in my day there was tendulkar and gaskar and what's you know somebody's uncle and what not they were all fantastic footwork this that flawless by the by the end of the first day rahane was ajinkya and by the end of the second day Uh, when when he by the time he almost reached the century he was aju 
you know so he'll he'll come back to being rahane next week or whenever the next time he gets out of cheaply so those things uh, <laughs> i think will keep keep happening but kohli and shastri are like, like the gruesome to some you know of indian, of indian cricket you know they're like you know everything that is evil you know the, the, the shastri is apparently always drunk and kohli is like some kind of martinet and like rahane is like you know the 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 the, the savior who's nice to the players and uh, you know who listens to the players and who the players love and like it's like you know the beatings have stopped and they've all risen out of the dungeon and won this great test victory and it's, it's nothing like that but it's a nice story uh, he's also understated by the way when he scores a 100 he doesn't jump up and you know yeah he doesn't he point his bat at somebody and you know, no cases anything like that you know well, there was a quote there was a quote from the Australian uh, uh, writer Malcolm Knox, uh, yeah. he, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, co- columnist and cricket writer, he he at, he wrote this at the end of, uh, I think day one or day two maybe. Uh, he said Rahane might be seen as a mere locum for Virat Kohli, but the Indian team have rallied in Melbourne like a democracy emerging from years of dictatorship, which I found pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's like first kohli was the was the was the was the new representation of the new india now rahane is the new new representation of the new new india the new india that rahane represents is actually the old india under dravid so that is we are just you know remixing old stories again ah, this is point and counterpoint as i want this it's a, it's like a it's like a no, great that, epic. that is a problem dude so even when uh, he was asked right i think in press conference he was asked whether this is your best 100 ever the dude is like no no you guys forgot lords you know that was a far more challenging 100 for me than this but the reporters i think told him to shut the hell up i mean they are like what the hell are you doing we can't print this <laughs> go back and say go back and say this is the greatest 100 that i've ever scored without my two legs and two arms and no not we, we came out. you should say this is the greatest 100 anyone has ever scored so oh, yeah. yeah he tried in his in his defense like he tried he gave it to them with both barrels like intent character all the words were like thrown in it was like the, the greatest hits of the media package forget the interviews well, you know what he did he scored a 100 that itself was full of character and then yeah. he gets run out and he goes and encourages jadeja after getting run out imagine I what know. did kohli do to rahane fuming Co- Kohli oh. didn't score right that in itself is a great improvement the fact that kohli didn't score is a sign of grandes quiet influence you know this is so so the thing is that uh, <laughs> captaincy so much of captaincy is about optics right i mean there is very very little that we sitting you know so far away watching on television can really is find any way to actually quantify the captaincy i mean we can make observations but it's obviously the players themselves or the uh you know the the people who are there on the field who are will be able to judge more and explain actually what happens with the uh, captaincy but the fact That's that he true. is so anti kohli anti kohli in terms of not that he is anti kohli he is like uh, the opposite of kohli that uh, you know i think that that itself immediately stands out for everyone to be like oh, okay so understated and so uh, so calm and so unemotive and okay that is fine that is all good but you know that still there is one still you know, doesn't know exactly how good a captain he is i don't necessarily think that he is the anti kohli we have decided that he is the anti kohli oh yeah that is exactly that is actually you know that actually <laughs> is pissing me off if very honestly like we try to define things by by the things that there aren't like rahane is someone who isn't a kohli this win is great because there weren't any key players but we still met so what did hap- what happened in those 3 days that actually i mean is anybody talking about it is anybody interested to talk about it australia scored at two runs per over which shows that which shows that they were unwilling to take risks and which means that indians were on point with their bowling for a sustained period of time matching matching uh, the australian attack and in this context not having your strike bowlers makes sense without that context if you just say we didn't have shami we didn't have ishan and we still won is kind of condescending or insulting to the bowlers right like it's condescending or insulting to siraj who who is on his debut and he kind of executed the plans that were set out or that he discussed with the teammates and his captain and his coaches to perfection 
right to get those wickets to control the flow of runs at the standard of test cricket this indian bowling uh, has been quite outstanding and frankly the the test match was decided by bumra and ashwin i thought you know they they gave india a lot of control they gave the provider a lot of menace and basically i think what shaped the test match was that once australia bowled out for 195 uh when india batted australia were forced to defend runs much earlier than they would have if they had bowled first and that meant that they couldn't have catching fielders and that meant that after about 40 overs of india's innings basically they could never attack as much as they would have wanted you know so they would always have to hedge and have you know one or two less slips than they would like you know uh because they couldn't afford to give up the extra boundaries that would go because of having those extra slips you know and you saw that you know i mean rane uh, edged a few which went in the gap between you know keeper and slip and slip and kali and you know he fended at a couple which landed in you know where short leg would have been uh so that's what shaped the test match and someone was going to survive and it happened to be rane and he that that got india a 130 lead and then in the second innings india exerted control again i think uh, i think bumra and ashwin were basically they they are the difference they 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 are they are both terrific bowlers and they are bowling as well as they ever have yeah i mean uh, that's a point i wanted to bring in actually about ashwin has uh, is uh, on his fourth tour right to australia um and how uh, I, and i wanted to ask uh, you know uh, mahesh and ashoka people who have uh, pro- probably watch ashwin much closer than i do across uh, you know formats and even first class cricket if they're noticing something different i mean is there i mean there is if there are some obvious things of course in terms of uh, the line is uh, he's focusing on is obviously uh, sometimes especially with the right handers has been middle and leg but the variations that he's coming through i mean so there are times in which every over he's bowling six different balls and that is uh, and, and with control and you know he's not uh, just doing it uh, for the sake of uh, you know uh, trying things and all that so uh, ashwin has been uh, i think uh, i mean of course bumrah has been exceptional but uh, i think for me ashwin has been the most enjoyable to watch through this series uh, yeah by by his own accounts uh, he is saying that the role that the team wants him to perform is like is to you know control the run flow and also to take wickets which is you know uh, a very very difficult job for any bowler you you've been we have been hearing this word subtle variations in commentary for like decades now right like and and we are seeing it for the first time with ashwin like uh, at least uh, i am seeing it for the first time when the variations are actually subtle the variations in length is like he's trying to bring the batsman i mean forward forward or then push him back making him unsure of his footwork and trapping them in the leg gullies or i mean trapping people in in you know leg slips and leg gullies are like it's not something that you do when you don't have control over your bowling to an extent where you can predict where you are going to pitch the ball and how much it's going to turn it it has a deep understanding of your own bowling and also of the pitch of the nature of the pitch and and ashwin is, is there is in that zone where he, I, i suspect that he's always been in that zone for the last 2 3 years uh, unfortunately because of xyz reasons he's not been in the squad consistently as far as overseas tests are concerned but i always felt that he has been in that zone i mean he he has been a very very good bowler in the last at least 3 4 years he has been good in any sort of conditions and he's been probably the best spin bowler in the world probably I mean, without question right and the the way to look at ashwin is and one is just look to look at the records but if you look at it from 2011 when he first came to australia in fact after the first adelaide test and that was a time when ashwin was a lot more ambitious he, he tries out a lot he bowls a lot of the carom ball and he experiments not these subtle sort of variations he ex- he experiments with more uh, apparent obvious sort of variations and he kind of backed himself to do it and that's the that's what gave him success at home when he was bowling and in fact after the adelaide test i remember ponting saying that lion should pick up some tricks from mashwin on how to bowl on flat wickets like this i mean that's how it started his first test in australia and subsequently it kind of tapered off because i mean australia is generally not good for for finger spinners at large and and he was on his first trip in his early days 
even at home i don't think while he was getting a bag full of wickets i don't think he cracked the the stock ball till about 2014 15 which is when he really took off consistently even at home so if you look at it 2014 was probably the only bad away leg he had where uh, in england he wasn't very effective and australia wasn't very effective but subsequently his opportunities have been limited because of that like one test he doesn't do well and because you have jadeja and jadeja is a much Uh, is a very attractive package right as an all rounder as also a very competent spinner himself so there's always that competition for the the one spinner slot so i don't think he's had enough opportunities to even for us to say that he was not great bowling away earlier i mean the samples overall were sizable but they were so sporadic they were so spread out uh, i don't think he had enough opportunities to learn and kind of reinvent himself but since even the last away like where he bowled in south africa england and australia the adelaide test where he started off he started off quite beautifully all the control that we see now his his uh, i mean shane one actually before uh, was it before ashwin bowled in the first innings he was talking about nathan lyon and how he should bowl a lot more outside off stump than what he's bowling now and that opens up both the inside edge and the outside edge and stuff ashwin ashwin is actually at that stage of his career where he has such great immense control over his craft uh, and he backs himself to both do a containing job and to be able to attack at the same time he can actually go around the wicket bowl middle and leg and still have both the inside edge and outside edge, edge in, on play and he's not bowling those carom balls in fact uh, when um, when uh, labushin got out was it isa guha on commentary she immediately screamed carom ball and shinwon had to correct her because it is not a carom ball but but that's what he's able to do even with a bit of drift and with the angles and with the speed and the speed i mean i think uh, greg bluewood did a small segment on seven cricket about the differential speed that ashwin is bowling at on the series one he's bowling slower and the wickets are also faster right i mean with that speed he cannot get the same purges in a place like england for instance and two there was a beautiful graphic of one of the overs where he was experimenting a lot experimenting purely in, in terms of the pace in the air each ball was coming at at slightly different pace to the batsman so while he's bowling slow overall but within that there's there's quite a bit of variation as well so the guy is really in his form in terms when it comes to craft and that, that is what is really showing you know I, i think he could have done an equally good job last tour as well because he was equally good uh, he got injured and and uh, there was a little bit of impatience about his injury because he got injured in england as well uh, so that that didn't go too well but but i think in terms of craft he's been there for a while now yeah i mean uh, when i said fourth tour i mean i took into account the previous tour as well uh, which is a little unfair because uh, he got injured uh, you know in that he didn't play the full full series uh, just uh, played one test if i'm not wrong right just played adelaide yeah and he bowled that bowled best thing Yeah, exactly. He he bowled well enough that India won that test, and then he got injured. Uh, and then the first tour, I mean, again, you know, he was uh, first tour to Australia. I mean, that there are probably like a handful of spinners, if at all, who have uh, you know uh, excelled on their first tour to Australia. In fact, on that first tour, I I remember one a recurring theme was uh, India were getting hammered, and Ashwin was sent to so many press conferences because nobody else was going to press conferences. fearing that people would ask them about uh, retirement and selection and all that so ashwin was carrying the can and uh, yeah 2014 was as you said uh, probably the one off tour that he has had there and this one has been exceptional and and the other thing is that uh, you know the other point is that i've really really enjoyed uh, when shane one has been on air with uh, ashwin bowling simply because you know he uh, get he puts you in the mind of the spinner so well i mean he is of course talking from his experiences but you know the little things that he says um enriches uh, the, the whole experience of watching ashwin bowling i mean you can see shane wan you know almost urging him saying when um, uh, in the previous test cameron green was making his debut and uh, he came into bat and ashwin was bowling and shane wan was saying you know you have to slow it down now you have to slow it down you have to stand a bit more you have to spend a little more time standing at the top of your mark to make green think because you want more thoughts to get into his head uh, so that he can mess up and then in this test he was talking about you know every time uh, ashwin would bowl a certain pace that you mentioned you know he would be you could see that he was so delighted to see that uh, change in variation the change in pace and um, you know the fields um so yeah that that has been a really good experience now the thing about ashwin though is 
he's able to get the batsman to constantly react to what he's doing you know in the sense that he's got the ball on a top and uh, he's he's got the ball on a string and and basically you you see batsman playing against ashwin and they're always you know yo-yoing between you know should i go forward should i go back should i go forward should i go back you know and that's because he varies the f- flight and the trajectory and what he's getting here is a lot of drift and that is sort of messing with a lot of batsmen's judgment of length i think so the and and then you know of course he's he controls his 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 pace uh, and his trajectory and his and and how high the ball is flighted and and all those things but you know i i think australia have also played into his hands a little bit you know because they seem to they seem to not want to wait against him you know the standard way to play against someone like ashwin bowling as well as he is would be to basically just block and until you get a boundary ball and then hit the boundary ball you know and forget about everything else but australia seem to want to you know score of far too many deliveries against ashwin at least that's the impression i get you know and i i i watch the whole thing on mute more 90% of the time uh mostly because i'm also doing something else uh and so i don't really listen a lot to shane one though once and twice he has been on in the feed that i get uh but you know ashwin and and bumra and, and and you know bumra is probably what talking about a lot as well here they are able to perform at a at a very high level in that you know the normal sort of restrictive uh spin bowler would just you know keep pinging middle and leg with a 36 field and go for two or three and over and you know that would be control you would you would probably go for 50 runs in 20 overs and that would be a good day but ashwin is able to do that while constantly probing and constantly getting the batsman you know caught in no man's land and that's wonderful i think i was watching noting down bumrah's lengths you know how he's how he varies his length like through and over and through the spell i was i was looking at that closely and again i mean mahesh spoke about ashwin subtle variations in terms of pace and bumrah's variations in terms of length are, have came with so much control i mean he uh, you know you have all these pitch maps that show the the ball you know pitching on a square handkerchief and you know a glen megra or uh, people uh, like uh, even uh, josh hazelwood can do that but bumrah is actually you know the sometimes he has he bowls spells which are the opposite he lands the ball in different areas of the pitch but because of his action and because of his pace and skidiness the surprise value that that has is immense i mean you have like travis head comes in for the very first ball and gets that ball that he got that you know ball that has reared up could have basically you know hit him but it hit his bat and uh, luckily for him didn't pop to the fielder but that's the kind of ball that no batsman would ever want to face first up you know that that to get that lift and bumrah can do that time and time again i mean it's a uh, like pat cummins yesterday cummins and uh, cameron green were having a good partnership and uh, looking very promising could have even gone on for few more runs but that ball that he bowled to cummins uh, adam gilchrist i think said that you know it, it's a dream ball for the fast bowler because when a young fast bowler you're coaching a young fast bowler you always say aim at the badge of the helmet because that is the perfect bouncer and that's exactly where that ball was going and cummins obviously had to find a way to get it out of there and uh, edge the ball so the and of course of course bumrah has that Uh, you know the ability to bowl that lethal yorker and how that ball didn't go past cameron green's bat i still won't know i mean that was such a perfect middle stump yorker and green it just hit the bottom of the bat and somehow squirted away but uh, yeah i mean he, to... he even uh, he even bowled a slower ball yorker to come inside i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Was, he did he did nearly nearly did it He that did. was amazing and that was amazing so yeah i mean the the both the variation in pace and length and uh, you know difference of lift that he can get it makes him a terror to face i was also impressed with uh, him getting steve smith out i mean there 
I mean, uh, you, you can say that he, she, Steve Smith shuffles across, and therefore the the plan would be to bowl fast and try to hit the leg stump. If you get a glance of the leg leg stump, you know, to clip the bales. I mean, it it did come off, so it looked very good. But you know, to to actually execute it, uh, you must have some serious amount of control and you know uh, uh, and confidence to even attempt such a thing. Steve Smith could have very well, you know, nudged it away for four. Uh, it's just the pace. It's a combination of pace, precision, and you know, confidence to do the thing that looks very good on paper. Because a lot of bowling plans look very good on papers because we amateurs do it, right? Like we see it. We say, okay, the batsman is doing such and such a thing, and sitting in our, you know, uh, armchair, and we say, oh, maybe he should have bowled that length. To actually do that, and with precision and control and you know with pace that is something special i i mean only i think today i think uh, two or three bowlers are consistently capable of doing that one is him cummins and i think rabada and even hazelwood are, are even capable of doing that at that precision that is a precision art no he's got the big advantage of his action right one you know uh, like sethi mentioned he he experiments a lot and he can vary his his length quite a lot and quite expertly that in a normal bowler that's actually a disadvantage right if you see umesh doing that he would get tonked around the park and umesh is quick he's not it's not just the pace it's the skiddy nature of his action right? i mean there's there's so much acceleration that happens from the top of the head to to basically his follow through right from the time he just before release to release to the follow through is so accelerated it's a, it's a bit like the symmetry effect of jeff thompson going all the way back right I mean, a lot of his pace came from the exaggerated sort of backswing he had of the arm. So that acceleration has a big part in why his bouncer is so potent. Like, for instance, that bouncer to head of the first ball. Even if he could fully predict it, I don't think he would have he would have been any better prepared to play it better because it's you as a batsman you get very little time to be able to to kind of judge the length coming out of that hand. You know, uh, Sachin keeps talking about a lot about, let's say, facing someone like Malinga or or anyone with a slightly different action. With Bumrah, he's got the advantage of a unique action, great control, immense pace, and the confidence to execute all of them at will. Yeah, I think the 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 plan to Smith is basically been years in the making. A lot of bowlers have tried this against Smith. uh because smith has that remarkable shuffle where he basically takes the whole fourth stump fifth stump line out of the equation and <clears throat> basically he takes his outside edge out of the equation uh you know it's because he is is his outside edge is so far outside the line of off stump and basically he backs himself to never miss the ball when it's straight and it takes a lot of it and and he's good enough that against the average medium fast bowler he's got that pace and that pace covered like he can play that like it's a part time off spinner you know even even <laughs> mohammad shami i think he would play quite comfortably uh with his method but the but the bowlers who have had success against him uh, you know jofra archer did it uh, first in 2019 as far as i can remember uh with his sort of extreme pace and he he kept bowling short at at smith and he basically disturbed smith's footwork you know he brought a little uncertainty into smith's footwork and he got him you know hooking a little compulsively and he had a trap set for that and then neil wagner took that up and you know delivered a bouncer barrage and uh, new zealand generally tried to kill smith's scoring you know new zealand against new zealand last year smith faced 627 balls in that series and made only 214 runs so they didn't get him out but they 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 shut him down for sure you know and then bumra has this ability to attack the stumps which is uh you know comins has that but basically what bumra does is that he uses his bouncer and his and his fuller ball to much greater effect than anybody else right now in in, in the game and and he's got terrific control of both of those and he he thinks like a spinner he's he's constantly trying to you know move the batsman around and get the batsman to do what he wants the batsman to do he really he's really like he's very special he's got pace but he he can control that 90 miles an hour as well as you know ashwin controls his off break 
Uh, that's a remarkable thing. The way even uh, Ashwin has bowled to Smith. I mean, of course, uh, he had that uh, terrific uh, wicket, that terrific delivery to get his wicket, which was uh, pretty much reproduced again in this test to get uh, Manus Labuschagne, which, uh, you know, again, uh, is pretty funny because uh, Labuschagne is seen to be the photocopy of Smith and then Ashwin gets uh, both of them uh, caught at slip with the state of one in two successive tests. But yeah, the, the way he has uh, both tied him down and uh, threatened him for his wicket, threatened his wicket, um, you know, it, it speaks volumes about, uh, you know, Ashwin's quality as a bowler. That's that's the control. No? That's, the, that's what the combination of, you know, the control of flight and the drift is doing because it's not letting batsmen take chances, you know, and it's not letting batsmen make decisions fast enough. And and so what that does, I mean, Smith has said, I think just today there was an interview, I think someone posted it. He gave an interview to some Australian radio program in which he said, you know, he's allowed Ashwin to do, to control proceedings against him in a way he's never done with a spinner before in his career. I don't think that's a coincidence. I mean, Ashwin has done that to every, every, back, every Australian batsman and every batsman in the last four years. I mean, I, we all talk about, you know, Ashwin getting a lot of wickets in India and it's because of spinning, is it, because, you know, the wickets are helpful and all that. But he's still beating batsmen in the air. You know, the opposition spin bowlers are coming to India. They're not as successful as Ashwin. There's a reason for that. You know? So, I think both with Ashwin and Bumbra, they have a remark, they have a, firstly, they have, they have a sort of formidable arsenal of variety at their command and you know they right now they're in a zone where they they're able to put it together and basically control the proceedings you know at some point in the series some batsmen will get on top of them and then they'll have to you know sit back a little and you know try and try and gain, regain that control and it will be interesting to see how they do that but for now they're on top uh, in the lead up to this game when Shami was injured and uh, the, the my thought process was sure, Bumra and Ashwin will do their jobs, but uh, you know, it's either Siraj or Saini who's going to come in and batsmen can wait out Bumra and Ashwin and they can even score a uh, score of uh, Saini or uh, Siraj. But that didn't happen this test match. You know, Siraj also was, you know, very, very disciplined. But, uh, you know, with Umesh gone, I, I am very scared for India in the next test match. You know, it's a very high expectation and you are asking your bowlers to be accurate all the time against world-class batsmen. So, that will be the test, I think. Uh, it's not uh, Bumra or Ashwin. Uh, if, if batsmen take risk against these two bowlers, fair, fair point, they'll get the runs, but also there is chance of wickets. But I think... Uh, a signee or Siraj, if put under pressure, might bowl, you know, half volleys or, or maybe knocked off their length. That is the danger that India is running into in the next two tests. One of the things that, you know, like, like even last series, for instance, we've had, you know, Pant scoring a big 100, Pujara scoring a lot of runs. One of the things which sometimes we, we can get carried away with the momentum as even cricket followers is that you've got two high quality pace attacks and, and one world-class spinner and another nearly as good. I understand the focus on bowling. I understand how unplayable they've been on occasions and how disciplined they've been. But we should also consider the fact that they're not going to be as penetrative in all conditions. Like even in the Melbourne test, as things started to flatten out a little bit, you know, like I think day two, day three, we're not as conducive. Even uh, uh, like you take Cummins out, Hazelwood and Stark was not, were not as potent once the ball started to get older. I mean, the way Stark was bowling, let's say, with the new ball at the start, up front of the, the, the first over that he bowled to, um, Agarwal was phenomenal. And, and also the follow-up over that Cummins bowled to uh, Gill. But I don't think the, the support act to Cummins were as impressive in the ball goes like you would. That's one thing. So, you know, come Sydney, you might get a flat wicket and, and whatever. So this counter-attack thing is not as simple as saying, you need a punt to go and take his chances and him to score a 70. You also need the conditions to slightly favor the odds of a sustained counter-attack. Otherwise, you're essentially playing lottery, right? And what these uh, these modern great bowlers have done is that they do two things very well. One, they have immense control and they resist the temptation to 
to go all in 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 you know uh, bowling that odd sucker ball to induce a batsman to drive and get a wicket even the drive that you get is still of a good length ball like like the one that you saw with gill for instance in the first innings is still of a good length ball so they have immense control and they have the patience they are also a lot more aware of not leaking runs in the sense that like a wakar unis for instance was a million dollar bowler right you would you would bowl full if he goes for a four he goes for a four but he backs himself to take more wickets than concede runs and stuff like that but these guys also exert a lot of control over the flow of runs so which means essentially a counter attacking beginnings can only come when the conditions are slightly more loaded in in batsman's favor and that could happen in the next test one of the uh, things that uh... we haven't spoken that much about selection for the test and uh, i mean again uh, you you ob- uh, obviously there is an argument to be made that any 11 that india selects out of the pool of squad players is good enough to do the job i mean it uh, you can argue as much as you want about picking x over y and all that but uh, what happened was that uh, they dropped shaw for gill they picked pant ahead of saha and they played jadeja as the replacement for kohli which was interesting because uh, you know you're replacing uh, your uh, your a batsman with uh, an all rounder i don't know see the thing with me and selection these days is now i i have stopped having strong opinions about it because uh, i just say okay whoever plays plays and then let's see what happens but uh, there are a sizable number of people on social media and generally also outside social media who have extremely strong opinions about this my theory is that uh, this has intensified after all these uh, fantasy uh, leagues have arrived because now everyone thinks that they are uh, uh, great selectors because by virtue of picking their fantasy league team and winning they think that they can pick the indian team also so i think which... everyone has always thought that they were great selectors right like uh, <laughs> uh, that's not uh, i mean as far as the selections go uh, shah sitting out look like an eventuality and uh, but the question was whether you will put in kl rahul or uh, gill they went with gill fair enough uh, he he played really well in the practice games and stuff so why not is is the point that that didn't and saha with pant also was because that was the narrative right the dominant narrative was saha will be picked at home test and well pant will be picked in, in the away test and pant had that you know uh slightly easy 100 where he knocked uh you know australia a b- bowlers around so that is also that was also seen as a move to strengthen your batting the only thing interesting was uh kohli for i mean jadeja for kohli which is not that interesting if you see jadeja the last 2 uh, 3 th- years his batting has been really really good across all formats not just you know uh, uh, uh tests his batting has been solid it the uh, captains in the teams that he has played have come to depend on him so as a batsman more than a bowler so uh so ha- having him and him providing at least if not wickets a control uh, at one end where he bowls like uh, 20 overs for like 50 55 runs is not a bad addition to the team is what i thought this is this i mean this looked like a fairly straightforward move i mean why why was this of any controversy i couldn't understand selection every selection is a controversy right why especially with the kind of image that kohli and shastri have see right now indian bench strength is so good you, like you could uh, outrage about why didn't you pick saini and why did you pick siraj i mean if, if he didn't bowl well or he had a bad test we could outrage the choices are so the, the next best choice is nearly as good as the, the first choice they're always is going to have and i have i have outraged about jadeja being picked over rashmi in the past i mean mine is a primarily a parochial sort of complaint but my point is the choices are so close the the pick of gill over shaw was clearly a response to the 36 all out i think if india had a more manageable or more face saving sort of innings i don't think they would have done that given the large sort of outrage over shaw and the way he got out i think it's quite unfair right because he played in new zealand he was not too bad I mean, considering how the team performed overall, he wasn't he, bad. He had a fifty, I think. He yeah, had he had one fifty, so he was not bad. Okay, you can have all the opinions you have about his technique, whatever. I mean, I'm not going to go get into that. But point is, as a, as a selector, this is showing consistency. He played in the two tests; he was not too bad. You come here, he plays the first test. 
fair enough. If you played Gill straight away, I'm okay. But you played him in the first test. So this seemed like a sort of populist sort of decision, especially after 36 all out. That I had a bit of a problem with it. Not so much because, I mean, I think Gill, I prefer Gill over. That's just my personal preference, not because I think one is definitely better than the other. But I thought it was slightly unfair to show. But let's just, that, that is still a marginal decision, objectively speaking. Saha and, and Panth is always a constant debate, right? And in some ways, the team got itself into a hole by, by playing Saha at home, arguing for his merits as a better keeper, which he is undoubtedly. And after 36 all out, you had to be for the batting. And so, in a way, the Jareja decision was made easier by bringing Panth in for Saha. And then you bring Jadeja in. I think Jadeja's decision is primarily made with respect to wanting to play five bowlers for the remainder of the series. And because Kohli left, they found the perfect opportunity to test that. And, and they brought Pant in to kind of balance out the, the batting props. You know, all the marginal choices, you know, except for, you know, the people who are the certainties. And right now there are about eight certainties in the 11, in the Indian 11. The, the other spots, the two or three spots that are always up for grabs are, you know, decided by a combination of, you know, conditions, the desired balance and who they think is playing well at the time. You know, I mean, Gil demonstrated the exact same problems against Cummins that shot him. You know, I mean, he was cut in half twice, you know, once it was a dropped catch to pain and the second time it went for a boundary, lemon cut boundary, you know, it played away from the body. Uh, he had the same problems, essentially. You know, they, they, he was dropped three times. He hit three catches in 65 balls in the first innings. But he made runs and that's good. And, you know, I, I, I've always thought that all three of them, Perth, Shaw and Gill are going to play 100 tests for India. You know, these are not, these are not some, these are not Lakshmi Ratan Shukla or some marginal selections. You know, these are really, really, you know, highly rated talents. And they are good and they, they, they have the record to show for it. I will take offense at Lakshmi Ratan Sukla. He's a highly rated talent in, in <laughs> Bengal. Shah is like a scored a lot of runs in Test cricket and a lot of runs for Bombay and a lot of runs everywhere he's played, you know, in every format. He's only what, just over 20 now? He by any standard, he's his record is phenomenal. You know, the same with Shubman Gill. You know, these are all three of them are players who for their age have achieved what like you can probably count on your on the fingers of one hand players who have achieved what they have achieved at that age if you're in india the selection choices are they are spoiled for choice and they make whatever they want or the choices they want and all of them are reasonable as far as i'm concerned i don't particularly care one way or the other who they pick you know there's always a good reason for why they select who they select now there are it is true that there are other good reasons for picking other people but that's neither here nor there. It's their job to pick and they pick. That's fine. I'm totally with you on this, Karthikeya. But before we proceed, let me make a case. Mayank Agarwal should be dropped and Rohit Sharma should open in the next test. Anything else is a brainless decision. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 do, I do think that's true. Actually, with, with Mayank Agarwal, I do, even when he was making runs, you know, he, he, the moment he came up against, uh, you know, uh, someone who's genuinely quick, he, he, he sort of has this tendency to be late on the ball. And <clears throat> I don't know, that's not fatal. He's still making runs. You know, that, 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 that's the other thing. You know, we have this idea of Tendulkar and bust, you know, like if you're not Tendulkar, is you're not like as close to flawless as any human being has ever been when it comes to batting. You know, uh, you're basically useless. And that's not true. Every player in the world has technical problems. You know, every player in the world, there is something that's going to dismiss them. And yeah, Pat Cummins is going to exploit it most times because he's really good. You know, so it's not the end of the world for a batsman to have a, you know, a technical problem, so to speak. You know, this idea that Shaw has like this really serious, hopeless technical problem where, you know, he needs to be sent back to the lab, you know, for a complete refit is just BS. I think Rohit Sharma's selection I will object to because uh, these are these are you know club kind of matches for Rohit Sharma. I don't think we should be wasting <laughs> his talent on such <laughs> frivolous series when when he can win like the next 400 IPLs for Mumbai Indians. I think 
we should preserve him for the next 3 months and uh, you know he should play the matches which count this yes, india Ashok, australia don't, don't, don't call it a club match he will come and win the series he has this habit of winning club championships you know that's why i'm saying his kind of talent is not necessary for such a low stakes match i mean there is a csk mi match that is going to happen next may in you know the finals it, the, there is captaincy is acumen those are the things rohit sharma should be concentrating he is here to demonstrate to prithvi shaw who's called him kadus on how to play pat cummins like <laughs> you got a footwork problem i'll show you i have got a footwork problem too but i'll still score runs no and and talking about rohit sharma i mean um, i was having this discussion of course uh, the general indian psyche with respect to cricket is that when you have a young indian batsman come up and score in test cricket and score with the kind of uh, you know this poise and style and class that uh, shubman gill has come with there there is you know there is a flutter uh, the people's hearts start to flutter and uh, things start happening in people's minds like they did with their very first crush in high school or something i mean there is something uh, crazy about that possibility and so i've been you know a few of my friends have been it's just been one test and the guy has scored he scored well he started well but you know i have, I have friends who have been watching cricket for a long time message me and say you know this is uh, this is gills decade i mean this is the next kohli we have right here which is perhaps true i don't know but uh, no, uh, let's uh, let's wait and watch i was i have been watching gill in a matches and uh, you know all other under 23s and stuff uh, whenever i could uh it's not by it's not by design that's just that when i when i watched he has played and i was messaging someone the other day that gill is 3 years late to his uh, test debut uh, and then i then the thought struck me that this this chap is just 20 or 21 and that is how he looked and that is how he played he he looks like i don't know how to quantify this he looks like a very finished product at 21 and that is very very rare no i mean we the last time we were admiring someone this young was uh, the a bowler rabada right uh, who was no but the last young. time we were last indian batsman that i can think of is is sha uh, is sha is sha exactly which is the irony is that when prithvi shaw was coming up the ranks and when he played his first test and when he got that 100 Uh, the kind of uh, uh, discourse that was on is exactly the same that is happening here so <laughs> it's amazing how the retention period for people is like you know that's so so small <laughs> yeah it shows that people are generally awful at evaluating cricketers <laughs> that doesn't make uh, you know uh, the estimation or or the feeling untrue i mean even today i feel that shaw and gill should should be playing for 10 12 years of test cricket or whatever that the highest level they are that kind of cricketer they look that kind of cricketer they look that kind of batsman so talking of early identification of talent somewhere out there <laughs> on the internet in one of my old blogs don't bring up rohit sharma don't bring up 2008 i have this line saying rohit sharma is the true inheritor of the next number 4 from sachin and what do you make of that line now i think um, yeah he was he got a raw deal i think i don't think he got the platform he needed to establish that no no i think at that point in time uh, mahesh didn't expect uh, mahesh might have thought that uh, kohli will move to number 3 the one thing he didn't foresee was pujara and that's no, why no, i think no, no, this was i think he's very salty with pujara that's why he never no, this was way before. before any of them made their debut so this was like basically when the big fab four was still uh, playing for india and the next knocking on the doors were uh, rohit rahane pujara badrinath I mean, Kohli was not even in the queue at that time, and uh, I was hoping Rohit would be the first one to make the debut. And true to uh, sort of uh, form, he actually was the first one in queue. He was supposed to play against uh, South Africa in Nagpur, which ended up being Saha's debut. Actually, he was the first in line, except that he gets injured on the morning of the test, and subsequently selectors forget that he was selected for the test squad first, and he goes on to struggle in the one day years. and they don't give him a test chance for 3 more years and even when he actually made his test debut 3 years later which was also such in the last series the the connect was pretty good for me like i was thinking sachin goes and this guy comes and takes over and he's going to like go on and and be the best batsman for the next 15 years and fortunately that never happened for a variety of reasons partly his own sort of fault but, but the larger point is 
no matter how good a judge you are even if it happens to be the talent that you are judging happens to be such in so many things have to fall in place for someone to go on to fulfill their potential and you're talking about a decade and more no and look at that look at prithvi shaw right he was in australia last year he was a uh, dead certainty to open after that uh, start that he had, had to test to his test career and then he had that uh, injury by step uh, on the boundary line uh, and he was ruled out now who is to say that uh, had he played the four tests uh, in the previous series uh, where uh, you know who who is to say what could have happened so i'm just saying the 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 tiny tiny things that can change the whole arc of your you know progress and the uh, arc of your career you there's no way to predict these things it's clear that you know if you have a good team you are always going to have more good players than spots and so it's obvious that some people are always going to miss out and it doesn't it doesn't i, I think basically it comes down to batting and bowling and we have really india has really good batsmen and really good bowlers and it has, more importantly it has more good batsmen and more good bowlers than there are spots so I mean, this is a really good Indian side, and this is why one of the reasons why you know there are a lot of these uh, ranking things. I, you know, I also tried one today, of you know India's overseas test wins, and I think you know Melbourne in 1981 was still probably the the finest Indian test win. If you sort of look at a differential between what was available to India and what was available to the opposition, you know, I mean, in that in that Melbourne 1981 test match, uh, India's opening attack. in the second innings was i think sandeep patel and kirsan gavri yeah and uh, and, and nobody and also every... gets the leg stump of greg chapel just like bomber steve smith here a legendary shooter <laughs> you know yeah yeah and uh, people you know there are people making uh, you know direct cricket to cricket uh, uh, you know comparisons here i saw yeah. people saying that you know melbourne 81 was a dodgy wicket on which india bowled in the end and all that but but come on man look at the kind of uh, resources that team would have had look at the kind yeah. of uh, a team that, i mean it's it you can't even it's a different it's a, as they say the past is a foreign country you can't yeah. you can't make any comparison between what the 81 team had and what this team has and kapil dev is like bowling with a cropped hamstring you know and it's like this yes just yesterday you had a you had a test match in south africa where you know half the sri lanka team is out with muscle injury <laughs> yeah i mean it is like umesh yadav continuing to bowl through the second innings of this match with uh, say uh, you know uh, part timers like uh, agarwal and all rolling their hands over i mean hello is, uh, hello uh, the yesterday was also the day when neil wagner bowled like 20 overs with a fractured toe and he said that uh, pretty much you have to dismantle me before i stop bowling so i think that is the only way you can stop that guy from bowling so yeah, you are exactly. missing you are missing the point which is see i told you at the beginning of this podcast this guy is going to come down to saying cricket is all about batting and bowling he is missing the basic cricket point of intent grit determination you know passion these are very crucial cricket points that nobody is talking about in today's cricket and we should actually rock talk more about intent that's what i yeah. feel yeah it is like uh, you know never forget that uh, when uh, leander pays won uh, a bronze medal in the atlanta olympic games uh, never for- i'll never forget that anecdote that he came up with after that which he said that you know there was a point in the game in that the bronze medal match which was it was all tight is very tense and then there was a butterfly that came and sat on his uh, racket and that butterfly had the colors of the tricolor basically it was uh, you know saffron <laughs> and green and all he had to do was to see that and that's it i mean there was no way he was going to lose after that and uh, yeah that's all it's about <laughs> actually he, I, i hope he got that against uh, agassi right he played the semi finals against agassi which he lost and no he didn't get it against agassi he got it against the other guy who he i know i'm saying uh, he could have got it then he could have gone on to win silver or gold or Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Absolutely. That butterfly—it is the butterfly's fault for not coming in that time. You know, the tricolored butterfly. The butterfly came that day also, but just uh, I think it was uh, in the colors of Pakistan's flag. So <laughs> that day he couldn't do well. The next day it came out in Indian color. So okay, so talk, okay, so to wind up this uh, pod, uh, let's just one of the things I must mention is one of the things when I was watching the uh, this test match is that every time there was a. you know an inside edge or outside edge 
or you know every time there was a batsman not in control i was like how the hell did that didn't they catch that how the hell did that ball go to the fielder i mean 36 all out has made me assume that every ball is going to go and to the fielder and get caught that's how perfect the collapse that was you know on the on the catches i'll say that you know essentially it doesn't really matter how many other catches get taken because as long as the chances keep getting created you know at some point enough catches are going to be taken uh, so it all really begins and ends with the bowling come on kedi i know this is your pet sort of theory about how catches don't matter how creating enough chances matter but that's fine that's if you are trying to build the most efficient machine and whatever but cricket is about winning against the odds and winning against the odds always happens because of some x or y event turning in your favor just about one thing like karsan gavri getting great chapel out is he got, like he might bowl thousand of the same ball to great chapel and he's not going to get out but on that one ball he did so probability wise it's a very low probability but because it happened we got history so i get your point when it comes to building a great team but when it comes to cricket results and how people react to those results i mean 83 world cup i mean how many how often is rich is going to sky that sort of innocuous ball from madanlal it's not going to happen but it happened and that kind of has a massive chain reaction after that so i mean i get it from a cricketing view as you would like to call it so it's a fluke but the fluke has consequences that's what i'm saying it changed the history of the world huh? just... that's no. how all changes happen right you see you're not going to create an efficient cricketing system fully planned no th- this is a very valid discussion and uh, but i think uh, it has slightly gone beyond the ambit of this podcast so we will definitely have another uh, pod on this and of course we at 81 all out we specialize in uh, talking about narratives and uh, and uh, these kind of uh, coincidences and uh, random events and linking up and everything else so yeah we should probably do a separate podcast on this but uh, on a cheery note let me end with this stat by the way which ab which ashoka shared on twitter which i missed Aust- after this two tests australia have taken 32 wickets uh for 679 runs at an average of 21.22 and india have taken 32 wickets for 676 runs at an average of 21.13 i mean both the tests might have ended in eight wicket uh, you know victories for teams but uh, it just shows you how closely fought and closely matched these teams are and uh, you know how it takes one bad session or one good session uh, you know to turn things around so that it, it tells you a bit about the engrossing nature of the series i think uh, meanwhile uh, south africa and uh, sri lanka are playing and they scored 1300 runs in two days <laughs> <laughs> that that is actually what has happened <laughs> i think test cricket uh, this this boxing day has been like uh, fantastic not just only because india won in melbourne i think the all three tests have been interesting in at one point or the other for one reason or the other uh, pakistan kind of found a rear guard action i think uh, sri lanka kept playing even after all their 11 were injured i think they hired some people <laughs> local people and started bowling and stuff so and and uh, faf duplessy missed a hard 200 and uh, drove people up the walls so there were a lot of things that were happening in this boxing day test uh, that was interesting uh, and for a year where there was like almost no tests this was like, actually a fantastic yeah week. can you believe we've had three tests in uh, simultaneous tests on in this year my god this is the high point of 2020 yeah yeah so okay on that note uh, thank you so much for joining you can go to our website uh, 81allout.com to hear the previous podcast uh, we did one after the famous uh, adelaide test and uh, we hope to do uh, uh, one or two more maybe uh, through the series we'll definitely have a series uh, review but uh, we might do one after the third test as well uh, so thanks thanks guys for joining thanks my my last word on this would be as king george 6 never said kohli is my pride but rahane is my joy Oh wow 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 this is <laughs> Ka- 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 you have uh, you have exceeded all my expectations so uh, thank you for coming to the party when it matters thank you thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs>